Good afternoon and most welcome everyone to this afternoon's lecture by Professor Ingemar Ottesson. As I said, my name is Torbjörn Lodén and I was recently appointed head of the Stockholm China Center. This is the first in a series of lectures that our center plans to organize. Our next lecture will take place on the 13th of November and then Professor Monica Gensbar from Stockholm University will discuss uh, Western uh, the ch changing images in the West of China since the 19th century. It's a very great pleasure for me to welcome our speaker this afternoon, Professor Ingemar Ottosson from Lund University in southern Sweden. Ingemar is a historian and a leading specialist on the history of Sweden's relations with East Asia and then particularly China. He recently published a book in Swedish which offers an overview of our contexts and relations with China um, from the beginnings and up until today. The title of this book is Möten i monsunen, Sverige och Kina genom tiderna, which in English means encounters in the monsoon, Sweden and China through the ages. Let us hope that there will soon be editions in both English and Chinese of this important book. As I've also said, there will be, um, it will be possible for the audience to uh, raise questions after the lecture. So after these very brief words of introduction, it is my pleasure to give the word to Ingemar. Please, Ingemar. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. Maybe. So thank you, Professor Lodin. And uh, it's very nice to be here, to have the opportunity to talk about Sweden and China and our bilateral relations. And um, during the last years, uh, news reports have been dominated by stories of tense relations between our countries. However, this is just a segment of a long and eventful history. It is spanning over four centuries. Um, well, we can say there have been ups and downs, but there has never been a war between our countries. And when discussing foreign relations in China, I think quite naturally, the emphasis will be put on um, uh, relations between China and the Western great powers. Um, and there has often been conflict quite frequently. However, when talking about Sweden and uh, China, I think this in a way presents an alternative picture uh, of uh, the relationship between Europe and Asia. And uh, well, we have been in contact since the 17th century. In the 17th century, there was no Great Britain, there was no United Germany or no Italy for that matter. There was no St. Petersburg, there was no Washington DC. It's quite a long time ago. And um, before we look into um, uh, the individual chapters of this story, because I'm going to make a chronological survey. Uh, before that, I would just like to show you a scene See if it works, just a moment. Can you see it? Yeah. And um, this is the city Jingdezhen in the Jiangxi province. Sorry, Ingemar, we cannot see your screen. Oh, you can't see it. Why? <laughs> what a pity. Can you see my uh, first picture here? No, we can only see you. How strange. Just a moment. Should I try maybe share screen once again? 
Ja, yes, just sorry for the interruption. I'm no problem. We would like to see your, your pictures. Yes, yes, yes. Here, good, wonderful. It works. <laughs> okay, okay. So, as I said, I want to show you a scene, first of all, from Jingdezhen, uh, a city in the Jiangxi province, in the interior of South China. And, um, well, it's a tiny little city today, rather sleepy, but, you know, it keeps memories of a uh, great past, a golden age, we can say. Uh, uh, when I landed there, because I've been there, when I landed there, it was in the midst of a snowstorm. But uh, I was full of expectations because I was going to see a number of uh, magnificent uh, art objects made of porcelain, Chinese porcelain or China ware. Uh, because this is the specialty of uh, Jingdezhen. Uh, I was also going to inspect an orchestra with blue and white instruments made of this uh, exquisite material. And when I was going to the center of Jingdezhen, I remember I passed a hill called Gaoling, and Gaoling has enriched our Swedish language with uh, the term kaolin, a kind of clay. And when one is in Jingdezhen, one should remember that there are few places in China with more connections or closer connections to Swedish history. And um, once upon a time, uh, orders from eager Swedish customers were reigning over this city. And um, for example, one order was signed by uh, Carl Linnaeus, a well-known Swedish botanist. Another order signed by Johan Tobias Sergel, uh, the famous sculptor. Another one by Hedvig Fralotta Nordenflykt, female poet. We can say that Jingdezhen supplied Sweden with the uh, East India porcelain of that time. We are speaking about the 1700s, sometimes called mm -hmm. our Chinese century, the age of enlightenment. It is one of the real glorious pages of Sino-Swedish history that I'm showing here very first. But as I said, there have been ups and downs. And um, <clears throat> Well, Jingdezhen, this is a part of a long story, uh, a story that was until recently never told from the beginning to the end. Now I have written a couple of books about this. Uh, I made a first attempt in, let me see, it was in 2005, a bilingual book about Sweden and China through the ages. And now uh, the, the book uh, published last summer in, in the Swedish language. And um, what I found is that there are a few nations that have stimulated Swedish imagination as much as China. But you know, sentiments and attitudes, they have fluctuated wildly sometimes slavish admiration, sometimes fear or suspicion. Uh, and uh, one uh, can say that the ideas in Sweden's ideas about China, they, they have been formed by intellectual fashions. They have been intellectual fashions and it's not that people have calmly and uh, 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 individually been thinking about the country, but rather that they have been influenced by the trend of the times. And these trends, these trends have changed. One inevitably thinks of the monsoon winds. That explains the title of my Swedish book. You know, monsoon winds that suddenly change direction, and that is according to season. So uh, our relationship is almost like a uh, succession or a sequence of monsoon winds. And why have the winds blown like this or that? 
Well, one answer, of course, is that objective reality has changed. China is not the same now as then, and Sweden also not. However, it's not the whole explanation, I think. It's also about that we, the observers or the, the people who have been the actors, we have changed too. Our mindsets have changed. And this does not just apply to China, of course. It applies to our relations with many others. Not long ago, there was a book uh, that appeared here in Sweden. It was called Sweden and Poland, 1000 years of love and war and love. Uh, so you, you see, it has happened with many others. Uh, of course, there was no war with China, but uh, sometimes dramatic changes have been taking place. Um, I sometimes wondered why nobody else had written the whole story about Sweden and China before. After all, there has been much research about this topic. Many articles uh, have been written about the Swedish East India Company, for example, and its trade. And uh, there have been many books about the Swedish explorers and scholars in the early 19th century active in China or uh, dealing with China. In Sweden, we all know the explorer Sven Hedin, for example, or the archaeologist Johan Gunnar Andersson, not to talk of the linguist Bernard Karlgren. The question is just what happened before them or in between or after. Uh, it seems that research has concentrated on the heroic pieces, the heroic chapters of our history. And that is understandable. But I think we need to know about other eras too. A kind of a more complete picture is necessary. Oh yes, bilateral relations. As you understand, it's, um, it's a wide concept. I think it's not enough just to do research on official relations, treaties, state visits, and so on, because the bulk of relations are uh, contacts or connections between private individuals or organizations. We have trade, we have Christian mission, science, entertainment, uh, tourism, everything is relevant to this subject. And before we start looking at the chronology, I also want to say that we should know there are some basic conditions uh, somehow underlying our relations. First of all, of course, distance. We are far away from each other. And today, distance is not all that important as it used to be. We can fly there. But in the old times, normally you had to go by ship in either direction. Okay, the good thing was there was no jet lag, but it took much time. Just a moment, I think I have a question here, no? Anyway, distance, geographical distance has been characteristic. Uh, the Silk Road, no, maybe not, but um, the, the sea route. Another thing, another basic condition is asymmetry. We are not the same size. Okay, Swedes know that we know that we are a small people compared to the Americans, but chi the Chinese, they are four times as numerous as the Americans, even more uh, asymmetry or disparity. Just a moment. I think I have. Yes, and um, so we can say that Ch Sweden is a tiny actor. Uh, it can't compete with China when it comes to land area or population, uh, international influence, military power, nothing. So Sweden is not all that well known in big China. 
uh, I think Sweden often has got lost in a multitude of small European nations. I mean, from the Chinese point of view, I heard a story a few years ago, two people uh, traveling through Europe in a car. They were able to visit 19 countries in one day. Uh, that is unfathomable to the Chinese, maybe so many small nations. But yeah, this is reality. So the consequence is that Swedish interest in China has always been more intense, I think, than Chinese interest in Sweden. And um, if we look at foreign trade today, for example, just look at the share of Swedish foreign trade that China accounts for, and then the share of Chinese foreign trade that Sweden accounts for. It says everything, it tells you everything. Uh, so this means that there has been more interest in Sweden and there is more source material on the Swedish side, source material that I have used. Uh, so asymmetry, disparity, there is a totally different kind of asymmetry too. I think I have to mention it. And uh, just a moment, I hope you can see this now. Historically speaking, it was the, the Westerners who went to China, not the other way around. I mean, the Chinese didn't sail to Great Britain and colonize Southampton, no. Uh, in the 15th century, there was Admiral Zheng He, I know that, but uh, nobody can deny that. Uh, the Westerners were the first ones, or the Europeans were the first ones to um, dominate the seven seas. And among them were the Swedes, although a bit marginal, but we were there. So uh, it would take until the mid 1800s before the Chinese would travel west in larger numbers. So this also means that my story, especially the older part is a lot about Swedish activities. Okay, now it's high time to take a look uh, at the monsoons. How did they blow? blow? And uh, I am now entering chapter one, the pioneer era. They, di they didn't blow very much in the beginning, not at all, because this was really the pioneer era and the actors were adventurous Swedish sailors, rather anonymous. We don't know so much about them, but we know that they were in the service of the largest multinational company of those days, the Dutch East India Company. You can see the ships here. And uh, this made it possible for those Swedes to sail very, very far from home, even all the way to the coast of South China, including Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, by the way, was uh, ruled by the Dutch between 1624 and 1662. Who was the first Swede in China? Unfortunately, we, I can't mention any name. We don't know this exactly. Uh, these were illiterate people. They didn't write about their experiences, regardless of how exciting they were. But we know that a number of Swedes were employed by the East India Company in the la late Ming era, and uh, quite certain that several Swedes uh, walked on Chinese soil in the early 17th century. However, this part of the story is a little bit anonymous, but we know a few of the pioneers, yes. For example, Frederick Coyet. Frederick Coyet was a man who was promoted to the high ranks of the Dutch administration. He even became the governor of Taiwan but during his period as governor, there was an uprising by the local Chinese population. And uh, in fact, he and he, his Dutch uh, people, they were expelled. He would become the last governor of Taiwan. And for that, he was punished by the Dutch. Their reliction of duty. Uh, he was banished to a remote outpost in the Dutch East Indies. So that was Frederick Coyette. There were no official relations during this period. Uh, Sweden spent all her energy on uh, warfare in the Baltic region, in Germany. Here you can see our king, Gustav Adolf, Gustav II Adolf. 
And uh, yeah, we had colonies. Sweden had colonies in the 17th century, two colonies, a small one in America, a tiny one in Africa, but nothing in Asia. So, well, this period, mutual knowledge is very shallow. We don't know very much about each other. There was no uh, Swedish image of China, maybe except for the knowledge that China is very far away, a country very far away from us. A Swedish travelogue was published in 1667. It's a description of uh, not just China, but also Japan and the East Indies. And the image there is vaguely positive, but it contains errors and misunderstandings. We expect that. On the Chinese side, there was also some information on the country that they called Xuejia, or yeah, there were several names for our country at that time. Uh, but this information you could probably find in a special library in Beijing, a library that was not open to the general public. And it was information provided by the Jesuits uh, who were working at the imperial court. So this is chapter one, we can say, the 17th century and the early 18th century. But now it's time to turn the page and see what's happening next. Uh, and uh, you already know what I'm going to say because I was talking about porcelain before. Um, we can say that now the monsoon winds start blowing and it's really a tailwind for China in this period. Uh, in order to understand Sweden, we have to look a little bit at the European context too, because the leading opinion makers now in the 18th century are the so-called philosophers in Paris. And they are witty skeptics with wigs on their heads and they are implacable enemies of um, the Catholic church and uh, the absolute monarchs. China was an absolute monarchy too, but it was hailed as the model country by the philosophers. And why was that? Well, they had to admit that China is, uh, there is despotism in China, but they emphasized it's enlightened despotism. And that's a very, very big difference. So, uh, we can say the philosophers were not very well informed about China, but they had very strong uh, views. And they used China as an argument in debates that were actually about Europe. The leading authority all over Europe, uh, the authority on China in those days was a Jesuit, Father Jean-Baptiste du Alde, who had written four big volumes with a description on China. And um, he had never been in China himself, but he had many avid readers, especially or among others uh, in the Swedish elite. That was French speaking. Everyone could read French and they read Du Alde. And um, we can say that they were heavily influenced by him uh, the intellectuals in Sweden, I would say most intellectuals, there, there were uh, exceptions, there, there were, but most of them, the mainstream, they were positive to China. Some even worshipped the China of the Qianlong Emperor. And it was an idealized China, not necessarily uh, real China, of course. Um, and uh, China was seen as uh, the cradle of all wisdom and it was said that the Chinese were more virtuous than other peoples and the country was ruled according to noble principles. Oh, this was the predominant view. And in 1766, Swedish parliament discussed whether they would introduce freedom of press. And among the proponents, uh, one among the proponents, uh, when he motivated his proposal, uh, among other things, he said that this system exists in China, so we must have this too. And the proposal was adopted, and for six years, you could discuss political matters rather freely in Sweden. Um, well, we can say that in some respects, it was really a 
lack of knowledge on China. But um, generally speaking, there was more and more, you could read more and more about the country. Quite a few good travelogues uh, were now appearing in the 18th century, Swedish travelogues on China. And um, a librarian named Johan Erik Ringström compiled the first Chinese dictionary with 800 entries, um, but not from Swedish. It was from Latin, the language of the learned. Yes, so uh, I am here discussing the intellectual fashion of the 18th century, but we shouldn't forget this China interest had several dimensions. It was also about fashion in the uh, normal sense, a more common sense of the word. It was the so-called chinoiserie, the China craze. And it's noticeable in architecture, painting, uh, music even. Um, and um, we can say this is about consumption. It's about status objects. And uh, in already in the previous century, the British, for example, had acquired the taste for tea. And now prosperous ladies would wear silk garments and use fans. You can see this is a Swedish painting by Alexander Roslin shows this. Who would not like to make neighbors envious by possessing cups and plates with East India porcelain? Yeah, so um, this was the China craze. And uh, I'm talking about luxury goods, of course. And um, the fact is that during this period, a middle class is now born in Sweden. And they are really ambitious consumers. And um, they are deeply involved in this wave of China interest. In order to satisfy them, our government in June 1731 had to found a national East India Company, the first Swedish East India Company. And uh, the headquarters were located in the uh, economic or commercial hotspot of Sweden. At that time, Gothenburg, the third largest city of Sweden. Now it's the second largest one. And this China interest was embraced, of course, first of all, by the upper class and by the royal house. The Swedish king, Adolf Frederick, in July 1753, wanted to surprise his queen, Lovisa Ulrika, uh, sister of Frederick II of Prussia. She had birthday and he wanted to surprise her. So he erected a lovely little Rococo castle called China that has almost become the symbol of that age in, in Sweden. Uh, but as always, this is imagined China, not necessarily the authentic China. So some things remind us of China and that's all. Um, the East India Company, I said, don't think that this is a kind of a modern enterprise. And it's more of a semi-official institution equipped with all kinds of privileges and almost an authority. So when the East India Company was founded, uh, our government thought that now is the uh, time to open official relations with China. However, this was not possible. Uh, it was not realistic. Sweden, like other Western nations, had to uh, put up with uh, trading in Guangzhou. That was not bad, of course, but uh, trading in Guangzhou, Canton, as it was called, uh, very far away from the political center of the Chinese empire. So there were no official relations in the 18th century. However, there was one Western nation that was, who, that was able to station an envoy for some time in Beijing, and that was Russia. After the Treaty of Kyachta in 1727, and the first Russian envoy was a man called Lawrence Lange, a Swede, actually, 
who had been a prisoner of war, but later entered the service of Tsar Peter I. So, well, he belongs to Russian history, not to Swedish. But this was the second chapter in the story. And now we move on to a more uh, sinister one, number three. Fashion is changing, uh, the intellectual fashion included. And uh, now we pass the turn of the century. We are now in the early 1800s. The French Revolution has made the concept of enlightened despotism obsolete. And this leads to a reappraisal of China. China is now seen as politically quite backward. Uh, there are despots in Europe too. Napoleon, for example, he claims that his power rests on popular will. He arranges referendums and so on. But when the Europeans write about China, they say that power there rests on whims, uh, only whims. So uh, there is a more critical picture of China. Also, the China craze is now succeeded by another fashion uh, interest in the Near East after the French military campaign in Egypt in 1798. So there is a shift. And um, it's also the age of the Napoleonic Wars, fought on land, but also at sea. And the Napoleonic Wars, they spell the death sentence for peaceful trade, for example, for the Swedish East India Company, dissolved in 1813. And then for about three decades, almost, no Swedish activity at all in China. Maybe that was lucky after all, because it prevented us from getting involved in the trade frictions leading up to the Opium War in 1839. Because now there is a new economic uh, ideology, the philosophy of, great, of free trade, uh, really uh, unrestricted free trade, Anything that can be sold should be sold. And uh, the supply and demand of different goods, for example, opium, should only be regulated by the so-called invisible hand. That had been written by Adam Smith. So this ideology is now uh, getting very influential. What does Sweden do? Well, Sweden is now becoming more and more isolated. It has adopted a neutrality policy. From the 1830s, Sweden has the habit of declaring herself neutral in all sorts of conflicts. And the Opium War is no exception. Sweden was neutral in that one too. However, guess who is going to benefit from a British victory? Of course, many Western powers would. Um, and the British, to be sure, were militarily superior. They imposed the Nanjing Treaty upon China. Uh, euphemistically, they said they had opened China. And uh, the treaty and others were later called the unequal treaties because uh, the privileges were on the Western side. China lost her tariff autonomy, for example, couldn't set her own tariffs. Uh, Westerners were outside of Chinese jurisdiction, extraterritoriality, as that was called. We can say this was the beginning of a century of national humiliation for China. But now a number of Western nations stand in line waiting to get the treaty, just like the British one, because the British have proved it's possible to get this kind of treaty with the Chinese empire. And uh, among the nations standing in line is Sweden, or to put it more correctly, the United Kingdoms of Sweden and Norway, because at that time we are in union with this country. We are under the same king, but not under the same flag. When one looks at Sino-Swedish relations, it's sometimes like a line with sine curves going up and down. There is activity, then there is more activity, then activity ceases, there is a break, then activity resumed again. Everything starting from the beginning. 
And I think there was such a feeling on March the 20th, 1847, when we at last opened official relations with China, our first treaty with China. Uh, by the way, this treaty uh, remained in force until 1908. Then it was supplanted by another one. No, not so big differences between them, but uh, and these treaties were also very similar to the treaties that other Western nations had with China. Theoretically, it gave Sweden a lot of prerogatives. But in reality, this period is a story about failures, at least two big failures for the Swedish part, because first of all, the 19th century was a period of individualism. There was also religious revival in the West. So when China, so to speak, was opened, um, people who were missionaries benefited from this. A number of missionaries, Swedish missionaries, for example, traveled East, they traveled to China, and they tried to convert people to Christianity. However, this enterprise that involved a lot of uh, invested money and time didn't uh, succeed very well, we can say. It was, it's really the story of a failure. The, the mission went on all the way until around 1950, but didn't yield very much. The other failure, is about trade. Uh, trade didn't flourish in the so-called treaty ports, Shanghai, Xiamen, Qingdao and the others. And um, well, trade was now free. Uh, individual businessmen could come from Sweden, but they didn't know very much about Chinese mercantile culture. So they were not very successful there on their own. And uh, Swedish products were also very highly priced. They were simply too expensive for their Chinese market. This was not just negative. It also showed that uh, Sweden, it's a developed country, an advanced country with high quality products. We are talking about the industrial revolution. Sweden and the other Western nations were now industrialized. So this made Sweden a developed country. And uh, China from the 19th century on was now looking up to the developed nations, wanted to emulate them. And when the Chinese now start traveling west, they go to the developed countries in order to acquire as many impressions as they can. So there were Chinese visits, for example, in Sweden. The first one was in 1866. Here's another one. There, there were several. There, there was a series of visits, uh, study visits. Sweden as the teacher, China as the disciple. We can say it's a new pattern of relations, uh, more mutual, not more symmetrical, but more mutual starting from this point and uh, uh, continuing all the way up to our own time. So um, their relationship is now changing. The 1800s, the age of colonialism. Yes, um, Sweden in a way was involved in this too. The Swedish government did not allow opium trade or something like that. This was expressly labeled as immoral. However, Swedish ships were involved in other things transports of Chinese coolies. And the coolies were people who worked under appalling conditions in Southeast Asia or in Hawaii and the plantations and so on. Swedish ships had a part in that. This is, this is a fact. So uh, we, we were interacting within the a colonialist structure. Uh, the image of China in the 19th century was quite uh, negative, a dark picture, as I have uh, already said. Uh, Swedish journals describe China as politically arch-conservative, 
they thought that Chinese culture is stagnant. The Chinese were people still eating with chopsticks and persisting in uh, celebrating New Year on a, a different date from the Westerners. The Chinese were against foreign invasions because they were so anti-foreign. Well, this was how they talked about China in those days. Might was right. But uh, a more constructive chapter uh, would come uh, in the years after 1900, uh, or anyway, after the demise of the Qing dynasty in 1912. Now, Sweden sends an envoy to China, to Beijing. You can see him here to the left, Gustav Oskar Wallenberg, a businessman, a new kind of diplomat. And he puts trade at the center of Sino-Swedish relations. Trade is the most important to him, of course. It's uh, driven by material interest, uh, normally stronger than the forces behind, for example, cultural exchange. And um, Sino-Swedish relations have been, uh, have often been characterized by trade first. But I also talked about the Swedish scholars and explorers of that time, and uh, so we shouldn't forget them. Uh, for example, um, uh, linguist Bernard Kahlgren was one of those who contributed to the world's knowledge of China. He was doing research on several things. He was our first professor of Chinese in Sweden, and he did research on several things. For example, how the Chinese pronounce their language during the Tang era, quite an exclusive subject in Sweden 100 years ago. We can say that interaction between Sweden and China in this era, the Republican era, is a mixture of old and new. Uh, the China discourse was still uh, tainted by uh, should we say, exoticism and uh, orientalism. But on the other hand, after World War I, there was a new kind of thinking about international relations. The Versailles Treaty, uh, nations were now seen as theoretically equal, and uh, Sweden was among their countries prepared to renegotiate the old treaties with China, which we did. In 1928, China regained tariff autonomy. And there were, as usual, there were Swedes in China and a few Chinese in Sweden too, sure, but mostly Swedes in China, not least in Shanghai, the decadent Shanghai of the 1930s. Among them, um, uh, I can mention Eric Möller, Möller as we say in Swedish, a businessman, he was the chairman of the Shanghai Race Club, quite a prestigious position. It was he who built a large villa in central Shanghai, the so-called Moller Villa. You can see to the left, it's a hotel today. But um, this world would collapse because during the universal economic crisis of 1929, to 1932, Japan started expanding on the Asian continent. And uh, thus Japan came into direct conflict with Western political and economic interests, not to speak of Chinese interests. And um, the Japanese actions, for example, in Manchuria in 1931, caused irritation in London, in Paris, and in Stockholm. Now there was international organization. The League of Nations had been formed in Geneva in 1920. And uh, Sweden, as well as Japan and China, were members of the League of Nations. And the charter, the so-called covenant, ratified by 50 countries or more, said that nations should be protected from intrusions and invasions. 
if countries resorted to such kind of behavior, there would be sanctions. And uh, now uh, the Chinese strongman, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, you saw him on the last picture, he uh, appeals to the League of Nations and uh, to the Western countries. And this is music to the ears of Sweden. Sweden eloquently demands sanctions against Japan, supporting China in this conflict. However, the great powers compromised. There was no substantial league action against Japan. No sanctions anyway. The league criticized Japan, yes, but Japan just withdrew from the league. And in 1937, there was an all out war between China and Japan. But this era is also um, is marked by a Swedish reappraisal of China, again, now in the positive direction, because there's a lot of sympathy for China, the fighting China, fighting against aggression. Uh, and um, I think this demonstrates that Sweden has often been influenced by other Western countries. You saw in the 18th century, there, there were the influences from France, 19th century, free trade ideology from Britain, 20th century, more American influence. Chiang Kai-shek and his wife and the Republic of China were very, very popular in America. It's, it's ironic that Chiang Kai-shek himself usually expressed support for more authoritarian ideas, not the liberal democratic Western ones, but uh, authoritarian and fascist ideas. But uh, this was not very much discussed in Sweden. Everyone wanted to see the bright side of China. And uh, China in the 1930s was often called New China, the new China of Chiang Kai-shek. Okay, this enthusiasm peaked in 1945 because metaphorically speaking, China got the gold medal in 1945. It was one of the victors in World War II. And um, in summer that same year, 1945, Swedish parliament gave up extraterritoriality in China uh, we can say the last traces of the unequal treaties disappeared that time. I think it was on the 9th of June, 1945. So enthusiasm for China was very strong. But just at the same time, Chiang Kai-shek got involved in the civil war, in a civil war with the communists, the communists uh, the Communist Party had been founded in 1921 and got greatly strengthened by the struggle against the Japanese. And now China is declared a People's Republic, uh, introducing planned economy and uh, cutting connections with many Western nations, especially Western nations, to a minimum, almost to a minimum. Although Sweden had been neutral through the world wars, and now neutral Sweden is arguably the first Western nation to recognize the People's Republic of China. This happened in May 1950. But the backdrop here is the Cold War. And um, chapter five, so to speak. The majority or the mainstream in the Swedish opinion supported the Western side in the Cold War. The Cold War was seen as a kind of a bipolar struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. China was not very much noticed here or it was maybe perceived as a, something of a Soviet satellite. The main debate was about the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, in this debate, many Swedes supported the Western side and felt threatened by the Eastern side. However, there were people who were quite favorable to the People's Republic. They were a minority, yes, but they were interested in uh, the China that was now being rebuilt. Uh, I must show you a few pictures here of people who were prominent in the 50s in Sweden. Um, yeah, well, uh, 
I, I should have shown you the authors Nils Ferlein and Arthur Lundqvist, but uh, here is a woman, it's journalist uh, Ingrid Segerstedt Wiebey. Anyway, a few of these intellectuals uh, founded the first Swedish Chinese association ever in 1952. And uh, they were benevolent. They had a benevolent, a positive view of China, uh, at least not negative. Uh, and they were very interested in modern China, in contemporary China, material production. They were interested in tractors and harvesting machines and five-year plans, all sorts of uh, such things. Whereas official Sweden, the interest of official Sweden was more in uh, was more antiquarian. Chinese antiquities, I think uh, uh, a really good representative for this was the king himself at that time, Gustav VI Adolf, because he was a collector of uh, porcelain and bronzes and so on. Uh, the intellectuals favorable to China, uh, they were not very much uh, active in the public debate. You didn't notice them very much because public debate in the 1950s was very much dominated by liberals or maybe right-wing liberals such as Herbert Tingstein. You can see him to the left here. So you didn't hear very much about uh, China at that time. One thing I notice when I talk about the 20th century is that the intellectual fashions, they don't last very long. They are, they are short-lived, much more short-lived than before. I think it's because of the general pace of change. Technology and lifestyle, everything has changed so dramatically in the 20th century. So after the 1950s, we are already in a totally different world when we come to the 1960s. Sentiments will change again. And um, well, the, especially the young generation in the 1960s, they viewed the world differently from their parents. They didn't think about the world divided into West and East. They rather thought about the world as being divided between North and South, the rich countries and the poor countries. And the rich countries were rich because they were exploiting the poor countries. Uh, this was the new left. The new left was really stimulated what was going on in Vietnam, the Vietnam War, the resistance against American warfare in Vietnam. It was the main media event maybe in the 60s. Here is Sweden. And um, we have not, and this also was good for radical, it, it favored radical leaders in the third world. Uh, leaders such as Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Mao Zedong, and uh, political groups now in Sweden started hailing what was going on in China in the 60s. The Cultural Revolution had now begun. And um, there were groups in Sweden formed for criticism and self-criticism. Uh, author Tore Setterholm talked about a new kind of human being that you could see in China now, more idealistic, more progressive. And um, the people of that time said that the Soviet Union has now degenerated into a class society, although they claim to be communist. But in China, the leaders and the common citizens, they are much more equal. The, the leaders should serve the people. So it was an interesting experiment, they thought. And this enthusiasm for China, where people had the right to rise up in rebellion, as they said, uh, this interest, of course, was not shared by everyone. There were people in Sweden in the 60s. I mean, every period there had been minority uh, not agreeing with the others. But most were very enthusiastic about China, very many, and even non-socialist debaters, such as Olaf Lagerkrantz, the newspaper man you can see here, uh, the newspaper Dagens Nyheter. So such people also had to admit that China is a very interesting uh, experiment. And 
we can say there was a kind of influence from China, egalitarian influence, although it's difficult to pin it down to see exactly uh, how we were influenced. But in the late 60s, for example, the, the head of the Board for Social Affairs in Sweden, Bro Rex said, he urged all his employees to call him simply do, you, very egalitarian, not using titles as before. So I think this is, you can feel uh, the pulse of the times. And finally, now it will change again. We are now approaching our times, I mean, China of our days. After Chairman Mao had passed away a few years later, a new policy was announced by new leader Deng Xiaoping, the opening up of the country, liberalization of the economy. And how did the Swedes react to that? Well, the, the really steadfast admirers of the Cultural Revolution, they got disappointed. They thought that capitalism is now being reinstated in China. So they were very disappointed. But if we look at the Swedish corporate world, and they had been very hostile to China before, but if we look at the Swedish corporate world, they noticed the change with great interest because they were thinking of how they could cut down production costs and uh, maybe outsource manufacturing to low wage countries. And here comes an offer from China at the right time. And what this would unleash, well, nobody could imagine that at the time. Trade would rise steeply. Uh, it was the beginning of what we call globalization. And, uh, now also not just trade from the Swedish side, but more and more from the Chinese side. So um, relations are getting more and more mutual and even less uh, asymmetrical than before. And um, not just trade, but also other things contributed to that. China was opened up also to tourism. There had been tourism before, yes, but always very small groups. Now it's modern mass tourism. First, mostly Swedes, I think. China was expensive at that time to travel to China, but more and more Swedes then gradually more and more Chinese. And this has almost, we could say, not just quantitatively, quantitatively but also qualitatively changed our relations because now they are, they are more mutual than they have been in the past. This is a very big change and, we could say that uh, connections between Sweden and China are more intense today than they have ever been, as far as I can see. Um, yes, anyway, this China was now uh, developing and in, uh, in Sweden, there was considerable interest and uh, also optimism. People thought that when China develops and when uh, China gets more prosperous, it will also sooner or later adopt the Western liberal democratic model. But the Tiananmen incident in 1989 showed that this would not happen soon. Uh, but on the other hand, Chinese economic growth continued unabated. As I said, we are talking about globalization, China turned into the workshop of the world. And um, uh, we can say that living standards in China were now higher than they had ever been in the history of the nation. And there was also a wave of Chinese uh, patriotism, self-consciousness. The campaigns were orchestrated by the Communist Party, but they resounded in the population too. They did. It was a more self-confident China. And uh, at the time of the financial crisis around 2008, it was clear to many that China is now the leading economic competitor to the, of the Western world. And this made um, ideas about China more cautious less optimistic also in Sweden because of this perceived uh, 
uh, economic struggle. Uh, China had kept a low profile internationally under Deng Xiaoping's era, but afterwards, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century, around 2010 or something, China starts uh, acting with more self-confidence, speaking with a louder voice, we can say, on the international arena. And this also um, makes, we can say, creates more areas of friction with uh, other nations. And uh, I personally think that the coming years will also see a lot of tension. But we, we can't stop there. Uh, it, it is of great importance, I think, to find ways of peaceful coexistence between the different uh, players in today's world find some kind of formula for mutually beneficial interaction, I would say, because we don't want to consider the alternative. And, um, oh, I see time is flying. I should conclude with something, a sentence in Latin. I can say something here. I can say, uh, tempora mutantur et nos mutamur in illis. Times change. And uh, we change with them. 400 years of ups and downs. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think there are some questions. Thank you very much, Professor Ottosson and Ingemar. You are my friend for a most illuminating uh, talk on 400 years of Sino Swedish relations and exchange. I, uh, as a matter of fact, this long story is not very well known even in Sweden and that is a pity because yeah. at least today when relations are a bit tense yes the historical perspective is extremely important some maybe some of our attendees do not know this but in, in Sweden I believe that only a handful of professional historians are really doing serious work on historical relations between China and Sweden. For that reason, Ingemar's work is extremely important. So you are a professor at Lund University and you work often in another place in, in Skåne in, in Sweden, I know, but yes. you also lecture uh, regularly in, in China, I think. Uh, I yes, 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 I do. And, and I, uh, I'm sure I also speak on behalf of most attendees when I say that I hope that you will have many disciples because this is. <laughs> Sweden is, of course, a very small country in terms of population, but nevertheless, even in the European or Western context, our relations and exchange with China uh, has not been insignificant. It's an important small chapter of Sino-Western relations, I, I believe. Uh, yes. As uh, Ingemar pointed out, we can now have, take some questions. I think we announced that this lecture would last for an hour, but we, we can have a lot for, for more time if, if there is an interest, a interest. So if there are questions, please write them in the Q&I box or whatever the is called. No questions? <laughs> to digest for our <laughs> audience, perhaps. Anyway, I think it's important that uh, history, the science of history, does not just deal with the Western world. It is rather West-centered now, but I think we, we uh, times are changing, the world is changing, our knowledge must also change. We must know more about Swedish relations with other parts of the globe, generally, I think so. Not least, I, I find it important that we um, pay attention to and keep in touch with the Chinese scholars yes. in this part of the world who are interested in this interesting uh, chapter of world history. Yes. Yes, that's a very good idea. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. if there are no uh, more... I see one question oh. here. Uh, John Myrdal's role, <laughs> uh, Swedish intellectual John Myrdal in the 1960s, I think he was once the chairman of the Swedish uh, Chinese, uh, it was called the Friendship Association during those days. Yes, I think he was a driving force. 
definitely during the 1960s in the radical phase when there were several adherents of the Cultural Revolution in Sweden. And uh, John Mudal is still alive. And as far as I know, he still keeps the same opinions as he had then. So yes, he's an important figure in Sweden. Um, and uh, the, the, the book he wrote about uh, a village in China, Chinese village, was translated into many languages, I should add. Any other questions? If not, it only remains for me on behalf of, of the Stockholm China Center, and I'm sure also on behalf of the attendees to, to express our gratitude to, to Ingemar, Professor Ingmar Ottosson for your excellent lecture, which I'm sure will be available on the net, beginning perhaps, if not tomorrow, so at least the day after tomorrow. And then I also, we hope that you will come back to uh, other lectures later, our, the idea is that we will arrange at least one lecture every month. Uh, so please keep track of this. I will also we will try to keep you informed and in, inform your friends. And if you have ideas about themes, topics for lectures or other activities that, that our center could engage in, please don't hesitate to contact us. Again, thank you so much, Ingemar, and thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great pleasure, thank you. And goodbye, everyone.